another comedy episode of All in This Book transcribed. By his own admission, Principal Osgood Conklin's astute leadership has molded Madison High into a streamlined machine which operates with the facile precision of a new car. But to our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison, it's the same old jalopy. That's true. Mr. Conklin is the same old flat tire, and Mr. Boynton still needs his battery charge. <laughs> but as the power of astute leadership, last Tuesday, we solemnly and traditionally observed the birthday of Madison's beloved founder and first principal, Rodar Chris. <laughs> The only Madison High principal ever to be awarded a distinguished service track by the Board of Education. Of course, Mr. Conklin has long been bucking for a similar honor, but inasmuch as the Board has ignored him for lo these many years, I was not prepared for the news with which my landlady, Mrs. Davis, pelted me at breakfast. Carlin, I was just leaving the market a few minutes ago when I saw Uncle Conklin pulling up in his car. He was grinning from ear to ear. What happened? Did he run over a teacher? <laughs> no, dear. Something wonderful happened to him. He caught pneumonia? <laughs> I'm serious, Connie. Last night he received a telegram from Mr. Stone, the head of the board, informing him that they decided to award him a plaque for distinguished service to Madison High. You're kidding. No, it's true. And was he proud? Why, when he showed me the telegram, his chest was all puffed up. Fine. Now it'll blend neatly with the rest of his anatomy. <laughs> How come you did your shopping so early this morning, Mrs. Davis? Well, I wanted to pick up some groceries for my sister Angela. A dreadful thing happened to her at the drugstore yesterday, poor thing. Angela's the absent-minded one in the family, you know. What happened to her? Uh, what happened to who, dear? <laughs> you started to tell me what happened at the drugstore to your sister Angela. She's the absent-minded one in your family. <laughs> she certainly is. <laughs> well, I guess that these dishes do that. <laughs> Something dreadful happened at the drugstore. Spring, Connie. In the spring of 48. Now, what happened to Angela? Oh, her. She bumped her head on the pinball machine, and the girl caused amnesia. <laughs> amnesia? Couldn't even remember her own name. Well, when the druggist sent for the police, Angela became so hysterical... She called him some awful names, Connie. But realizing she had amnesia, he forgave her for that, of course. Well, that's fine, but anyway, when her mind snapped back to normal, she felt terribly embarrassed. You know what a shy, sensitive, sweet old lady Angela is. Yes, I do. But what caused her mind to snap back to normal? She bumped her head again, getting into the patrol wagon. <laughs> blow on the head often cures amnesia, you know. I'm sorry I asked. <laughs> oh, that's probably Walter Dent to drive you to school. I'll go pick up some breakfast for him, dear. All right, Mrs. Davis. Come in, Walter. <laughs> Greetings, all clean of Madison's faculty. <laughs> I bow to the teacher for whom I have not but the highest regard, and I bow to the student for whom I have not but the lowest mark. <laughs> Now, Walter, Mrs. Davis is getting your breakfast. Oh, splendid. Uh, Miss Brooks, I happened to pass Mr. Conklin's house last night. Uh, well, I didn't actually pass it. I dallied there just long enough to let the air out of his tires. <laughs> Same. Yes. How could you? Well, it's easy. You just press the little valve down and... <laughs> call it retribution, Miss Brooks. Yesterday, I accidentally broke a window in Mr. Conklin's office, and it made him so mad he saddled me with a whole week's detention. So I decided to take out its value in trade, sort of, by playing a series of innocent little pranks on the old boy that are guaranteed to make his life utterly miserable. 
I'm afraid there's nothing you can do to pull Mr. Conklin out of the happy clouds today, Walter. Last night he received a telegram from Mr. Stone informing him that the board has decided to award him a plaque for distinguished service. Oh, Mr. Stone didn't send that telegram? He didn't? Of course not. I did. <laughs> That little beauty, my prize, Frank, Miss Smith. <laughs> I'm setting him up to an awful letdown. Comprende vous? He thinks all day he'll be madly awaiting that silly plaque, and when he doesn't get it, tell Billy Drop. <laughs> you've gone much too far, Walter. When Mr. Conklin discovers what you've done, it's my guess that you'll be expelled from school. Well, so how are you going to find out? Well, every criminal overlooks one little detail, Walter, and you're no exception. When Mr. Conklin fails to receive the silly plaque, it's only natural he'll investigate. First of all, he'll call the telegraph office and the whole truth will come out. Holy cow! I've created a Frankenstein! <laughs> in fact, if I should be expelled, what do I say to my pop? Oh, you've got to help me, Miss Brooks. But you wouldn't want to see me get the old heave hole, would you? No, I wouldn't, Walter. But my sympathies are also with poor Mr. Conklin in this matter. When I think of his fondest dream growing up in his silly face, the face, <laughs> positively cruel. Hold it a second, Miss Brooks. Hold it. I've got the old dream working. But, so I created a Frankenstein, okay? So now I've created a little scheme which, with your help, will play the monster in his lair. What's the layout, Louie? <laughs> This morning, you will drop into Mr. Conklin's office and subtly remind him of the case of the former Madison principal, Mr. Hargrove, who modestly declined the plaque from the board. Now, they deemed his gesture so noble that one year later they gave Mr. Hargrove not a little plaque, but a statue of himself, which is now ensconced in our auditorium. In other words, you want me to convince Mr. Conklin that if he should decline the plaque, he'll set himself in line for a statue. Exactly. But Walter, he'll never get the statue. Nobody can dream, can he? <laughs> Walter, don't you realize that if I should stoop to such a deception, I'd be a traitor, not only to Mr. Conklin, but to the school as well. Well, you all cooperate, huh? Okay. Just thought you were a friend, that's all. It's a desperate scheme, sure, but it's a desperate situation. You have your own problems, I guess? What happens to me doesn't really matter. Oh, now, please, no tears. No, I forgive you, Miss Brooks. If you want to let poor Mr. Conklin suffer to the point where my father will beat the daylights out of me, that's fine. <laughs> I'll be expelled. Okay, so what? You just can't help me. Oh, now, please, Walter. After all, you can't be a traitor. Who can't? Dry your eyes and call me Benedict. <laughs> She was in a hurry to get to your father's office. Oh, yes, you'll certainly find him in a wonderful mood. Daddy got a telegram last night, Walter, and you'll never guess what it said. And what do you bet? <laughs> it was from Mr. Stone. The board has decided to give Daddy a plaque for distinguished service. Yeah, sure. And Walter, look who's coming up. Oh, good morning, Denton. Uh, Mr. Stone. Yeah. Are you going to see Mr. Conklin, sir? Uh, no time for that now. Just stop by to say hello. And how are you, Harriet? Oh, I'm simply thrilled, Mr. Stone. Last night when Daddy received your telegram... Harriet! A telegram? From me, a telegram? Oh, well, perhaps my secretary sent it off without my knowledge after our meeting yesterday afternoon. It wasn't until five o'clock that we arrived at the decision. The decision, Mr. Stone? Yes. The board has decided to give Mr. Conklin a plaque for the single service. <laughs> I'm glad you opened my eyes, Miss Brooks. If Mr. Stone thinks he can brush me off with a silly plaque, he's sadly mistaken. A statue. That's what I deserve. Oh, please, Mr. Conklin, I didn't mean to upset you. I'm grateful to you, my dear. What a fool I've been. To think that I've been sitting here in sheer ecstasy, mentally savoring that putrid plaque. 
I shall resign the plaque, of course, modestly, and in a letter, as you have suggested. I'll get my personal stationer from my inner office, Miss Brooks. Excuse me one moment. Take your time, Mr. Donglin. Miss Brooks, I've got to talk to you. What is it, Walter? Oh, cow belly drop again. Everything I said in that phony telegram turned out to be true. What? I just saw Mr. Stone, and he told me the board has decided to give Mr. Conklin a plaque. But I've already talked Mr. Conklin into declining it. But then you've got to reverse course and talk him into accepting it. I'll wait out in the hall for you, Miss Brooks. It's good luck. Good luck. Well, great. Did uh, I hear someone in here, Miss Brooks? You couldn't have. You're smiling. <laughs> no, sir. If you heard the door slamming, it was just the wind. Now, if you'll excuse oh, Hold on, hold on. You know, I was just thinking. I've given my all to this school. Five years of faithful service. Mr. Hargrove served less than half that time, and for that, he got a statue. Yes, and what an ugly monstrosity it is. It's no wonder the students parked their messy chewing gum all over him. I think you might be happier with a plaque after all, Mr. Conklin. Nonsense, nonsense. I shall write the letter of destination as per your original suggestion, Miss Brooks. In it, I shall request a reply. You will wait for it. For a reply? Signed and sealed by Mr. Stone's death. But, sir, why complicate it? I have spoken. Are you on, Miss Brooks? Yes, sir. Bye, Mr. Conklin. Well, Walter, it seems congratulations are in order. Congratulations? What do you mean, Miss Brooks? Remember that Frankenstein you created? He just had a baby. <laughs> well, there I was, Connie Brooks, bride of Frankenstein. Star of Walter Benton's Pulitzer Prize winning scheme entitled, I Gave You the Bag, Miss Brooks, Now Hold It. <laughs> As I was about to leave my classroom at noon and head for Mr. Conklin's office, something entitled, That's What I Want for Christmas, came in. Hi, Miss Brooks. Hello, Mr. Brynn. Are you busy? No, what's your best offer? <laughs> Excuse it, Mr. Boynton. Can you excuse me? I've got to run over to Mr. Conklin's office. Walter Denton is in trouble up to my neck. Yes, I know. Walter confessed the entire story to me, hoping that I could come up with a solution. But I'm afraid that's all to me, Mr. You're carrying the ball. It's not a ball. It's a bomb. <laughs> Let us bounce it over to Mr. Conklin's office together, shall we? I'll be happy to tag along, if you don't mind. Say, I met Mrs. Davis as she was heading to the school cafeteria. I promised to join her for lunch, in fact. Mrs. Davis is in the cafeteria? Well, yes. She said she just didn't feel like dining at home alone. When Mr. Conklin lets you go, Miss Brooks, do you think you might join us? I don't know. I may join the Foreign Legion instead. <laughs> I saw Mr. Conklin briefly at 11 o'clock, and he was practically throwing a fit because Mr. Hargrove received a statue from the board. Ingrates, he called them. Particularly Mr. Stone. Really, I've never seen him so furious. Well, that was at 11 o'clock, Miss Brooks. Maybe he's calmed down a little by now. Well, here's his office. I'll soon find out. Come in if you dare. <laughs> yes, he has calmed down a little. Hi, Mr. Boynton. Aha! Before you leave that inkwell, please observe that I have entered under a flag of truth. Uh, let's dispense with the levity, shall we? Miss Brooks, instead of writing to Mr. Stone, I have decided to have a little chat with him. It's clear to me now that in view of my outstanding record, the board would have given me a statue long ago if Mr. Stone had not been working insidiously against me. Oh, you mustn't jump to conclusions, Mr. Conklin. After all, Mr. Stone is your superior, sir, and if you should flare up in his presence... Well, I see your point. Yes, yes, you're perfectly right. Close control, that's the figure. Osgood Conklin speaking. Hello, Osgood. This is Mr. Stone. And Mr. Stone, eh? <laughs> I've instructed the gentleman in our office to deliver your plaque just as... Oh, I found you in great... <laughs> Conklin. What's that? Osgood, I said this is Mr. Stone. Mr. Stone, Mr. Stone, Mr. Stone, Mr. Stone. <laughs> I have to call you Mr. Stone. I bet you let Mr. Hargrove call you Charlie. Rank discrimination. That's what it is. I've had just about enough of you. Goodbye, you... 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 You...
I guess I sold him off, Miss Bruce. There's absolutely nothing he can do about it except fire me. If he thinks I'm going to grovel it, fire me! Child, look what you made me do. You me? Yes, you. I was perfectly content with my little plaque until you came in and steamed me up. Now Mr. Stone will have my job. My little family will starve. Holy Toledo, look out the window. That man coming up the walk with the briefcase. The man Mr. Stone sent over with my plaque. Who wants the plaque on the statue? All I want is my job. <laughs> forgive you for that, sir. You know, Mrs. Davis's sister, Angela, she called the druggist some terrible names, and he forgave her. Come to think of it, though, she had amnesia at the time. Amnesia? That's it. I didn't know what I was saying. I wasn't in my right mind. Oh, now, please, Mr. Conklin. It's the only way out. Hello, my name is Turner. Mr. Conklin, I presume? Mr. Conklin, who's Mr. Conklin? <laughs> I've Run got... along, boy. I've got amnesia. <laughs> amnesia? Tell him, lady. <laughs> yes, sir. Mr. Turner, I'm Miss Brooks. Brooks, Brooks. Who's Brooks? <laughs> I've been taking care of Mr. Conklin here, sir. The amnesia came on suddenly. An accident. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry? Who's sorry? <laughs> Lunch with me, Daddy. Daddy? Who's Daddy? Daddy! Don't call me Daddy. I never saw you before in my life. Daddy! Daddy, who's Daddy? Don't look at me. I'm not Daddy. What's wrong with Daddy, Miss Brooks? Brooks? Who's Miss Brooks? Your daddy has received a blow on the head. Yes, he has amnesia, child. Amnesia? Amnesia? Who's amnesia? <laughs> You'll allow me to use the phone, Miss Brooks. I'll inform the authorities. They've already been informed. They're picking daddy up in an hour. <laughs> oh, no! Carry it later on. I will explain how everything happened. Now, you go have lunch and don't worry. All right, Miss Brooks. Goodbye, daddy. Oh, poor Daddy. You can just leave the plaque here, Mr. Turner. You needn't take it back to the board. I don't know anything about any board. I just came in here to sell a few brushes. <laughs> Get off, you nincompoop. Boy, this guy is wacky, all right. You bet I'll get out. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Conklin. I think I'll toddle off to lunch now. Not so bad. To be perfectly candid with you, Miss Brooks, I wasn't too fond of the amnesia bit. Didn't sound convincing to me. Nor to me. And I'd advise you to get the old brain working on a totally different scheme to clear we, Miss, Mr. Stone. Something clever. A uh, but, sir... Think, think. Dream up some nice, dirty, juicy plot. Remember, I hold you responsible for my present life. So if I'm booted out of this school, I'll take you with me. <laughs> That's the dirtiest, juiciest plot I ever heard. <laughs> he didn't even recognize me. Me, his own daughter. My goodness. You poor kid. Don't cry, Harriet. It was a blow on the head. He just said the authorities are going to pick him up in an hour. They're going to put Daddy away. Oh, it'll not only ruin his life, but mine and Mother's as well. Gosh, if there were anything we could possibly do to restore his memory, you could certainly depend on us, Harriet. But we're powerless. Wait, I'll have it. Why not give Mr. Conklin another blow on the head? <laughs> That's good, my sister Angela's amnesia. Hey, I've read about that in medical books, Harriet. If a person is stricken with amnesia due to a blow on the head, a second blow does sometimes restore his memory. Yeah. And you don't have to wait an hour. It's instantaneous. As soon as he gets whacked, 
<laughs> Particularly effective if the blow is delivered by surprise. Oh, but I wouldn't want anyone to hit, Daddy. It's a blow that may mean the happiness of your entire family, child. Now, you must be brave. Would you like to give it to him with my umbrella, Mr. Bowden? <laughs> It has a mahogany handle. You'd better leave me out of it, Mrs. Davis. I'm too strong for the job. Let Walter do it. No, not me. It's impolite for a student to belt one's own principal. <laughs> you doesn't have to be impolite, Walter. When Mr. Conklin opens the door, just say, forgive me, sir, and then they'll be. Harriet, if there's one thing that breaks me up, it's the crying of a female. Yeah, I'm the same way. It just tears the heart out of me. You have the courage to help poor Daddy, neither one of you. Yeah. Well, if you folks will excuse me, I, I want to go upstairs and kind of think a little. Guess I'll take a stroll over to the gym and maybe think a little. Uh, goodbye. Goodbye. Go on. Oh, no. You just can't depend on them. Well, you just dry your tears, Harriet. I'll think of something. Now, let me think. Think, Miss Brooks? I'm trying to, sir. How's this? You go home and I'll wait here in your office. Now, when Mr. Stone arrives, I'll tell him you haven't been in all day and that the person who called him those nasty names on the phone must have been a prankster imitating your voice. What an idea. I wasn't even here. An imposter impersonating me. Splendid, splendid. I'll get out of here, but... Look, the window. Mr. Stone's coming up the walk. Holy cow! If I tried to make a run for it now, he'd see me in the hall. I can't go out the door. I can't go out the window. What do I do? Well, it's a little early for the chimney, Santa. You're trapped. <laughs> He mustn't see me here. Wait. I've got it. A daring scheme. Oh, no more schemes, please. He won't see me. He can't see me. Not if I render him unconscious with a quick, painless whack on the noggin. What? Flood the head of the boy? The moment he opens that door. You lost all sense of reason, Mr. Conklin. When one hysteria carries him to the point... Stand back and be quiet. One quick blow and it's all over. Oh, good. What's the meaning of it? <laughs> he knocked him out. Oh, I've got to revive him. Wake up, sir. Wake up. Mr. Conklin, wake up. Stand back, Mr. Stone. Maybe if I slap his face a bit, Mr. Conklin. Mr. Conklin. Why, that maniac was throwing an uppercut at me. I had to defend myself. Mm. Oh, mm. he seems to be regaining consciousness. Oh. Oh, what happened? One quick blow and it was all over. <laughs> On your feet. You've got some tall explaining to do, Osgood. Osgood? Who's Osgood? <laughs> oh, Mr. Stone, oh, Mr. Stone. I was hoping you'd drop in, sir. How oh, I missed you. <laughs> he didn't miss you, Daddy. <laughs> I, uh, I seem to be missing you, too. Osgood. Why did you take a swing at me as I entered this office? Me, sir? You're mistaken, Mr. Stone. May I be struck by liking you? I get the door. I'll get it. I'll get it. Forgive me, sir. <laughs> wake up. Mr. Conklin, wake up. Please, sir. Benton, are you in the habit of knocking out your principal? No, sir. This is my lucky day. <laughs> You were struck by 16-year-old lightning. <laughs> I seem to be missing him. Another blow, another two. That's life, Mr. Conklin. What in the world is going on here? Yeah, I'll get it. Oh, forgive me, Hugging your handle. <laughs> Mr. Thompson, wake up, sir. Uh, what happened? What you have now lost four teeth, sir. Would you like to try for eight? 
I demand an explanation. Oh, good. I can't talk now. I'm a sick man. I'm very weak. By all, I'm going home. Forgive me, sir. <laughs> Up. Wake up, Mr. Boynton. Wake up. At least I got in one good look. Oh, oh, oh. Mm. Miss Brooks, what's happened? Don't look now, Mr. Boynton, but all you want for Christmas is your two front teeth. <laughs> Mr. Conklin was played by Gail Gordon. Others in tonight's cast were Jane Morgan, Dick Crenna, Bob Rockwell, Gloria McMillan, and Mary Jane Cross. This is Wendell Niles inviting you to be with us again next Sunday at the same time for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. Bring you Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. Time once again for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks Transcribed. But first, you get a little more comfortable. There is but one exception. Brooks is on the friendliest of terms with her fellow English teachers at Madison High School. The lone exception being Miss Daisy Enright. You might call Miss Enright and me friendly enemies. That is, we're enemies because we're both friendly with Mr. Boynton. <laughs> but since I was stuck at home with a cold most of last week, Miss Enright was able to outfriend me with him by dating him every night. So there we were, me in with a steaming inhalator, and her out steaming Mr. Boynton. <laughs> Well, after a restless night, I got up at 6.30 Friday morning, roused my landlady, and a few minutes later, we were in the breakfast room. For an unearthly hour to be getting up. How do you feel, Connie? Unearthly, Mrs. Davis. <laughs> I took a look at myself in the mirror, and I think my face broke. <laughs> my goodness. That's seven years' bad luck. <laughs> Let's put them on my bill. I have a charge account in the bad luck union. What are we having for breakfast? I'm afraid it'll be rather stupid, dear. You know that Rhode Island hen I'm keeping in the backyard? The one that the butcher told me would lay an egg for us every morning? Yes. The poor little thing didn't feel up to it this morning. <laughs> Well, don't look at me. I don't feel up to it either. <laughs> I'll just have some coffee. You're out of coffee, dear. I'm a tea. I'll take tea, then. I drank it. <laughs> Here's a glass of milk. It's nice and cold, isn't it? The toast is. <laughs> Here's the milk. I think it's a good idea to have cold drinks during this unseasonable hot spell we're having. The weather's really been balmy. Aren't we all? <laughs> Mr. Boynton remarked that it seemed like summer when he called me late last night. He promised to call me early in the evening, but he was unable to get home until after midnight. What kept him out so late? A Rhode Island hen named Miss Enright. <laughs> she happened to drop by in her car. Then she happened to take Mr. Boynton for a drive. Then she happened to run out of gas. Where? In the hills, Nash. <laughs> Mr. Boynton told me all about it. Had to walk three miles to a service station and three miles back with a can of gas. A six-mile house. Imagine. Then what happened, Connie? Nothing. Miss Enright was so pooped out from that long walk, she just drove him home. <laughs> Enright hiked to the gas station. Yes, he said he felt it his duty as a man to stick with the car and see that nobody stole it. <laughs> well, how 
do you like that? Mr. Boynton isn't the most romantic chap in the world, is he? No, but he ranks right behind Barry Fitzgerald. <laughs> date with me for tonight, though. He's going to take me out. Out where, Connie? Out to his backyard. <laughs> the weather's been so mild, he suggested that we have a barbecue out there, Mrs. Davis. The thing he dipped into his tool kit yesterday and built a barbecue pit out of an old bathtub. <laughs> My, he is handy, isn't he? The tools, yes, but give him a woman and he's all thumbs. <laughs> Miss Brooks, welcome back to school. Thanks. Oh, I was awfully sorry to hear about your cold. There are an awful lot of germs going around, aren't there? Yes, but let's leave Miss N right out of this. <laughs> I've got to report to your father, Harriet. Routine check-in, you know. Mr. Conklin's in his office, I suppose. Well, he is, but I'd better warn you, Miss Brooks. Daddy's in a very nasty mood this morning. It's codfish fall day. Codfish Balls Day? <laughs> Is that a legal holiday? I guess you don't understand. You see, every Friday, Mother makes codfish balls for dinner. And Daddy hates them so much, it just ruins his whole day thinking about them. Lately, he's hit upon a cunning scheme to palm them off on guests. On guests? That I don't understand either. Well, last Friday, Daddy invited Miss Enright over for dinner. And this morning, he offered her another invitation, but this time she turned it down. You see, Mother just cooks enough for the family, Miss Brooks, so when Daddy gives his portion to the guests, there's nothing Mom can do about it. That'll give you an idea how chagrined he feels about codfish balls. I imagine the codfish feel the same way about him. <laughs> this is all very enlightening, Harriet, but I really must go in and report. See you later. All right, Miss Brooks. Bye now. Good morning, Mr. Conklin. Well, 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 if it isn't my favorite t-shirt. <laughs> bless you, Miss Brooks, bless you. Huh? How it warms the cockles of my heart to see you again. Your nasty cold kept you away from me for several days, you naughty girl. <laughs> well, you simply must make up for it by letting me see more of you, mustn't you? Forgive me, sir, but I don't understand. My dear, I want you to come over to my house tonight for dinner. Now I do. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, sir, but I have a date with Mr. Boynton. With Boynton, you say? We'll bring him along, the more the matter is. Gad, what a ball you'll have. You'll have the ball, Mr. Conklin. Mr. Boynton and I have already made plans for a little barbecue in his backyard. A barbecue? Oh, a barbecue. Uh, no doubt you'll be feasting on my favorite barbecue ribs. Yes, we'll have ribs, I suppose. With hot sauce? With hot sauce. I have an idea. Since you can't come to my house, suppose I join you in Boynton and we'll have a million laughs. <laughs> Sorry, there'll be just enough food for two. Well, I'd better get busy. If I make this a day of intensive work, perhaps I'll be able to get those things off my mind. That's the ticket. Work. You may go now, Miss Brooks. Yes, sir. Goodbye and a happy work day to you, sir. And a happy back-to-school day to you. And a happy Codfish Falls Day to you. Good morning, Mr. Boynton. Well, sure. Gosh, you're a type of sore eyes. I want to thank you for being so thoughtful when I had my cold, Mr. Boynton. Oh, did you like the gift? Very much. I still have some left. Glad you liked it. It's the nicest box of Kleenex I ever got. <laughs> Just a little remembrance, that's all. 
Say, you were locked in at home for quite a spell. Must feel good to get out, hmm? Oh, yes, indeed. I can't begin to describe the eagerness with which I'm looking forward to this evening, Mr. Barton. We ought to have loads of fun. We? We, we, we. Yes. <laughs> you and me, us. Apparently, there's been a misunderstanding. Tonight, I have a date with Miss Enright. I say there's been a misunderstanding. Mr. Boynton, when you called me last night, you distinctly said, and I quote, we'll have a barbecue in my backyard tomorrow night. Oh, I get it now. <laughs> when I phoned you, Miss Brooks, if you recall, it was after midnight. So when I said tomorrow night, I didn't mean tonight. I meant tomorrow night, which is tomorrow. In the motion picture, our Miss Brooks holds the bag again. <laughs> Gosh, I'm sorry if I've disappointed you. Well, you have. I wouldn't deliberately hurt your feelings for the world, you know that. But then I wouldn't want to hurt Miss Enright either. Wait a minute. I have a suggestion that might meet with your approval. Suppose I hold the barbecue tonight and have both of you over. You and Miss Enright. Is that your best offer? It's all I can do. Then I accept. <laughs> but will there be enough food? Oh, don't worry about that. Miss Enright and I went to the movies last Wednesday, and it was grocery night. I want a whole box of stuff, big enough to feed a horse. Well, that'll take care of Miss Enright, but what about us? <laughs> now... Just one brushing with Colgate Dental Cream removes up to 85% of the... So the barbecue was to be a triple-decker affair with Mr. Boynton, Miss Enright, and me in the middle. Well, since I've always been one to blush at playing the lettuce in an eternal triangle sandwich, I discreetly avoided contact with Miss Enright during our morning classes. At noon, I strolled into the school cafeteria, and upon making certain that her saddle was not hanging in the check room, <laughs> I proceeded to my usual table where Walter Denton greeted me with characteristic effusion. The salutations of first flower in the from these hallowed halls chased me to the quick, Miss Brooks. But now I rejoice to see you back in harness. Thanks, Walter. <laughs> Pull up a chair for me and I'll hitch old Dobbin to the shed. <laughs> oh, certainly. Yeah, how about this corner one? Nicely concealed, isn't it? That's perfect, because if Miss Enright should come in, I'd like to avoid her. Harry, you told me Mr. Boynton's going to have a barbecue in his backyard tonight, and Miss Enright's been invited. So have I. Well, you too? It's co-educational. <laughs> well, I hope you have a lot of fun. What are you going to barbecue? Miss Enright, I hope. <laughs> you shouldn't say things like that, Miss Brooks. Well, in view of the fact that she's constantly praising your beauty, I, I really can't understand your aversion to Miss Enright. Why, only this morning she passed a very complimentary remark about your hair, I thought. Miss Enright did? What did she say? Oh, she said that you have the loveliest blonde hair she's ever seen on a brunette. <laughs> she claims that she's naturally blonde. Let's drop Miss Enright, shall we? I think if we try real hard, we might come up with a more pleasant topic. <laughs> There, Walter. Oh, hi, Miss Enright. The cafeteria is a bit crowded today. May I sit here with you and your mother? <laughs> mother? Oh, it's you, Miss Brooks. Oh, forgive my taking you for Walter's mother, darling. But you are looking younger every day. <laughs> Thanks, Grandma. You <laughs> pull up a sturdy couch and sit down. <laughs> oh, you're sweet. But this chair will do. Yeah, excuse me a minute, ladies. I've got to go and get some pie. Oh, hold my place. I'll be right back. Oh, how nice to be alone with you, Miss Brooks. I do enjoy your company. As a matter of fact, Mr. Boynton told me that we'll all be together at the barbecue tonight. And I was delighted to learn that you're going to horn in on us. <laughs> Oh, 
my pleasure. Now, don't you disappoint me, darling. If you fail to show up, I'll simply die. That's okay. You still have eight more lives to go. <laughs> Your sense of humor, Miss Brooks. It might interest you to know that I made a date with Mr. Boynton for this coming Sunday. It's my birthday. Your birthday? <laughs> if I knew it was coming, I'd have baked a bomb. <laughs> All right, now let's stop fencing and lay our cards on the table, shall we? As for me. We were out of pie, so I got ice cream. Don't interrupt, Walter. As for me, Miss Brooks, I have long cherished our friendship with the deepest possible degree of repugnance. <laughs> I love you, darling, from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> from way back there? <laughs> Miss Enright, I'm shocked. I think you ought to apologize for those terrible things you said to Miss Brooks. After all. Excuse me, folks. Oh, hello, Mr. Boynton. Dear Mr. Boynton, do sit down. There's a chair for you right over here, Mr. Boynton. Just walk around, Miss Enright. That's too long a trip. He might run out of gas again. <laughs> I'll just take your chair, Miss Brooks. Mine? I saw Mr. Conson a minute ago, and he said he wants you to get right back to your classroom. If you missed a few days of school, you're behind in some reports which must be turned in before your afternoon classes, Miss Brooks. Oh, great. Well, I'll catch up with you later, Mr. Boynton. So long, Walter. Yeah, so long, Miss Brooks. Goodbye, Connie. Goodbye, Daisy. Say, I like that, Miss Enright. What, Mr. Boynton? Uh, the way you and Miss Brooks address each other with such affection. <laughs> affection? It really gives me a warm feeling inside. Here you two are dating the same man tonight, and yet you're utterly free of petty jealousies. Well, I've known women in similar circumstances who do nothing but hurl catty remarks at each other. That's something I can't stand. Really, Mr. Barrington? Yes, indeed. But a wholesome, warm-hearted woman of goodwill, who at all times speaks endearingly of another woman, well, that's the woman for me. Oh, well, that's very interesting. But you know how I feel about Miss Brooks. She's not only remarkably intelligent, but breathtakingly beautiful. Huh? I like you for saying that, Miss Enright. Uh, uh, just a minute. Uh, before Mr. Boynton came over here, you were saying... your ice cream, Walter. <laughs> yes, Mr. Boynton. Every time I see dear Miss Brooks, I just want to hug her like the doll she is. Please, Miss Enright, not while I'm eating. <laughs> So if you want to get anywhere with Mr. Boynton, you've just got to be a, a wholesome, warm-hearted woman of goodwill, Miss Brooks. Well, it's the old story. You can catch more flies with honey than you can with vinegar. But I couldn't be so hypocritical as to coat Miss Enright with honeyed words, Walter. Well, just feed her the honey when Mr. Boynton's around. The minute he's gone, you can slip her the vinegar again. <laughs> I think you ought to give it a whirl at the barbecue, Miss Brooks. But what have you got to lose? Well, maybe it is worth a try. All right, Walter, I'll take along some Mother Sills pills and hug her like a doll. <laughs> Thanks for the tip. Yeah, don't mention it. See you later, Miss Brooks. Uh, where are you heading, Walter? Oh, it's down to the phone booth to call home, Mr. Boynton. My folks are going to visit relatives today, so I want to remind them to leave some money for me so I can have dinner at the drugstore. I guess I'll have to dine alone. Alone? Under the drugstore? Nonsense. I have plenty of food, Walter. Would you like to join us at the barbecue? Yes, yeah, I would, boy. I'll be there, Miss Boynton. <laughs> Good afternoon, Boynton. Good afternoon, sir. Oh, what sheer delight it is to see you, Miss Conklin. If there's anything that brings boundless joy to these tired old eyes, it's the sight of our beloved principal, whose genial personality and outstanding leadership have won him the love and respect of every... Oh, shut up! to 
talk to the boy who may someday be your son-in-law. <laughs> Out of my sight, boob! <laughs> Mm. <laughs> Mr. Boynton, my friend, I uh, I understand you're going to have a barbecue tonight in your backyard. Suppose I join you there and we'll have a million laughs. <laughs> very much to invite you, Mr. Conklin, but, well, I have already invited Walter Denton, and obviously you don't get along well with him. Mr. Boynton, shall I tell you a little secret about Walter? What? I love that boy. <laughs> what time do we eat? <laughs> I think I'll get some more charcoal for the barbecue pit, Miss Brooks. Excuse me. Surely. That's strange. Every time I turn my back, I seem to hear a peculiar sound. Hard to describe. Maybe it's my imagination, but... Oh, it must be. I didn't hear anything. I see you're making individual servings of hot sauce in separate pots, Miss Barton. Yes. Cute, aren't they? Oh, I wouldn't really call it hot sauce, though. Out of deference to the fair sex, I'm making it rather mild. How very considerate. Well, we men can take the real peppery stuff, Miss Brooks, but I wouldn't want to make it too hot for you. You never have. <laughs> What's that, Miss Brooks? Uh, skip it. <laughs> Lovely night, isn't it, Mr. Boynton? The firelight dancing in our eyes, shadows playing softly through the trees, the stars like platinum pendants hanging aloft, the full lustrous moon. Yes, indeed. This would be a great night for trapping gophers, Miss Brooks. <laughs> they often come out of their burrows on nights like this, you know. Gophers are... Without the traps, here comes one now. <laughs> Hi there, Miss Enright. Good evening, dear Mr. Boynton. And dear Miss Brooks, you look... Simply gorgeous. Oh, and you're ravishing. Your facial contours are magnificent. And your figure. Excuse me, girls. I've got to keep an eye on <laughs> Well, go on, Miss Brooks. What are you going to say about my figure? Huh? Just that if your girdle snaps, we won't have any room for the table. <laughs> well, in that case, we could simply throw the <laughs> Oh, something wrong, Mr. Boynton? It's nothing serious. I just licked my hand slightly with a barbecue knife. Oh, well, come along inside with me, Mr. Boynton. No, I'll bandage your little hand for you. Oh, you're very kind. <laughs> oh, come along inside with me, Mr. Boynton. I'll bandage your hand for you. <laughs> what a place. Good evening, Miss Brooks. Hello, Walter. Oh, Mr. Boynton. He's inside with Florence Nightingale. That's why Mr. Boynton's turned his back on me this evening. The sauce is cooking in individual pots, Walter, so I'm fixing this one up special for Miss Enright. Yeah, but isn't that Tabasco sauce you're pouring in it? Uh-huh. So far, I've poured in about a pinch more than half a pint. <laughs> Mary, Mary, she needs that stuff, she'll explode. <laughs> That's all right, I'll stick my fingers in my ears. <laughs> when I serve her this little grenade, I've got a hunch she'll let me have Mr. Boynton to myself tonight. Look, maybe she won't suspect me if you serve it, Walter. Would you mind? Mind? It'll be a pleasure. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Miss Enright. I certainly appreciate it. Oh, hello, Walter. Hi, Mr. Boynton. How are you, Miss Enright? Oh, it couldn't be better. But since I had a bandage for Mr. Boynton's hand, he'll be unable to serve. If one of you would be good enough to volunteer... I have a recruit, Miss Enright. Walter Denton, Mess Sergeant First Class. Oh. <laughs> yes, sweet Walter. I myself would volunteer, of course, but it's such a dreadfully hot night. You'll find it'll get hotter as it goes along. <laughs> Set up for you, Walter. Yes, yeah, thanks, Mr. Brooks. Greetings, greetings, one and all. Hello, Mr. Conklin. Dear Mr. Boynton and Miss Edline. 
water's here, too, Mr. Conklin. Yeah. Good evening, sir. Walter, my boy, my boy. <laughs> Come close to me, son. Huh? <laughs> When do we eat? You can all sit down, Arthur. I'll go help Miss Brooks. Oh, how's it going, Miss Brooks? Fine. These three plates contain spare ribs covered with Mr. Boynton's mild paw. This lethal plate here contains spare ribs covered with the Tabasco Roman candle for Miss Enright. <laughs> May heaven have mercy on her soul. <laughs> now, I'll serve now while you put on the coffee, Miss Brooks. Excuse me. Ah, here we are. Serve me that succulent dish, Denton. Ah, hello, lady. First, sir. Uh, here's your plate, Miss Enright. Uh, uh, no. <laughs> now, it's this one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, is it? Well, it doesn't really matter, Walter. Well, that's what you think. <laughs> here you are. Now, I'll just put my plate down here. Uh, Here's yours, Miss Franklin. Bless you, bless you. <laughs> You'll be perking in a minute. Yeah, and here's yours, Mr. Boynton. Uh, no, give that to Miss Brooks. I'll wait till the coffee's ready. Well, I hope this sauce is hot. I love real hot sauce. <laughs> Sorry, sir, but I made my mild sauce tonight. Oh, well, well, delightful. Mm-hmm. Now to bite into this delectable morsel. Mmm, 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 the tobacco song. <laughs> Eve Arden as our Miss Brooks returns in just a moment. That makes America. <laughs> now, once again, here is our Miss Brooks. Well, after sampling Mr. Boynton's barbecue sauce from a recipe entitled, I Don't Want to Set the World on Fire, I Just Want to Give You a Little Heartburn, <laughs> Mr. Conklin, Walter Denton, and Miss Enright fled the scene, leaving me alone with the bashful biologist. I, I can't understand it. I have many recipes for hot sauce, Miss Brooks, but I just gave them one of my mild ones. Ah, too bad. I guess I spoiled the party for you. Spoiled the party? Certainly. Instead of being surrounded by your friends, particularly Miss Enright, now you'll have to spend the evening with just me. Well, we all have to make sacrifices now and then. <laughs> I forgive you, Mr. Blimey. You do? You mean it, Miss Brooks? Josh, I think I could kiss you for that. I think you could, too. <laughs> I'm ready when you are. I know I'll blush like the very dickens, but, well, just one kiss. Here you are. <sighs> well, Mr. Boynton? Water! Water! <laughs> it's a lucky thing I gave him one of my mild ones. <laughs> it's taken on this drug to teach his English at night. Arm Ollie Stokes, Colgate Dental Cream, and Tom Ollie Shave Cream bring you our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. <laughs> it's time once again for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks and Stripes. Ever 
Ever since our Miss Brooks became an English teacher at Madison High, her motto has been life, liberty, and the pursuit of Mr. Boynton. But the shy biologist happens to be one of Cupid's coolest customers, and it's not easy to warm him up. So far, the best remedy I've found is a hot water bottle. <laughs> My frustration reached a new high when, for some mysterious reason, Mr. Boynton coldly and deliberately avoided me last Monday and Tuesday. And Wednesday. <laughs> Those were three days of no dates, no nothing. And by Thursday morning, his brush-off treatment had rendered me unbewitched, but definitely bothered and bewildered. <laughs> Since I considered the matter highly personal, I decided not to discuss it with my landlady, Mrs. Davis, when I joined her at breakfast. Good morning, Connie. Would you like some oatmeal? I'm glad you brought it up. I haven't seen him in three days. <laughs> I haven't the slightest idea who you're talking about, dear. Good. You say you haven't even seen Mr. Boynton in the past three days. I simply can't understand his behavior. I can. Mr. Boynton has a guilty conscience, Connie. I feel it's my duty to spill what I know. Spill what you know? Exactly. Connie, would it surprise you to learn that Mr. Boynton is a two-timer? Yes, it would. With me, he's never even been a one-timer. <laughs> it grieves me to tell you this, dear, but last Monday, I saw him gallivanting around town with another woman. Another woman? So that's it. This woman, Mrs. Davis, is she attractive? Beautiful, I thought. Oh. And about how old is she? I think she's about 65. <laughs> Huh? That's my competition? When he gets here, I'd like to be alone with him, if you don't mind. I understand. I've got to get dressed and run over to the conference anyway. They scheduled a family reunion party for tomorrow night, and Mrs. Conklin asked me to help with the preparations. They haven't had a family reunion in so long that she doesn't... Just a minute. That's probably Mrs. Mm -hmm. Boynton. I'll leave you two alone, then, so you can pump him about that old lady he's going with. <laughs> There'll be no pumping, Mrs. Davis. I have no desire to delve into his personal affairs. Well, do as you wish. I'll see you later, dear. Come in. Good morning, Miss Brooks. Hello, Mr. Boynton. Please sit down. Thanks. I'll pour some coffee and we'll have a nice little chat. Anything in particular you'd like to talk about? Well, no, nothing in particular, Miss Brooks. You pick the topic. Oh, no, you're my guest. You pick the topic. All right. Let's just talk about the weather. Fine. I'd like to know whether you plan to keep going with that old lady. <laughs> old lady? What old lady? She's a kid about 65. <laughs> Oh, that old lady. That's the one. <laughs> Get it. What's the 65-year-old woman got that I won't have? <laughs> now, just a minute. You see, I bought new furniture for my apartment last month, and since then I've been terribly in debt. For weeks, in fact, my landlady has been hounding me for the rent. So? And so I simply couldn't figure out how I could pay off my obligations until I saw this ad in the paper. Here, read it. Let's see. Wanted companion. Evening, 7 to 11. Salary, $35 per week. Send photograph and information to Joe Martell, Carlton Hotel. Well, I sent a note along with my photo, and the very next day the party sent me one month's salary in advance. In advance? $140. Now, until I actually reported for work, I had no idea that Joe Martell was a woman. An old maid in her 60s, in fact. The Joe is short for Josephine, you see. Well, naturally, I, I wanted to quit right off the bat. Why didn't you? I couldn't, Miss Brooks. I'd already spent $140. <laughs> oh, great. Philip Boynton, the lady's home companion. <laughs> the only way I could get out of the job would be to return Miss Martell's money. Now, in view of my desperate predicament, I was wondering if you might let me borrow enough. To, well, that is... Now, well, could you give me a check for $140? Certainly. Then we could take turns bouncing it to the bank. <laughs> I'm as broke as you are, Mr. Boynton. Then I'm stuck. 
Now, please understand, my relationship with Miss Martell is purely a business one. My principal duty being to escort her to fashionable places for dinner. Of course, she pays the check. Nah. Same type deal we have. <laughs> we always go Dutch, and you know it. I apologize. What are some of your other duties? Well, she happens to have very poor eyesight. So after dinner, I have to read to her. Then, when the reading is over, she pats me on the head as if I were a little boy and sends me home. Good night, son, she says. Son. She calls me son. It tears my heart out. Now, don't cry in the coffee. It's weak enough. <laughs> Mr. Boynton, although it's perfectly innocent, I'm afraid that your whisking an elderly woman about town may cause tongues to wag. Yes, I'm well aware of that. I dread to think of the consequences if Mr. Conklin should get wind of it. In fact, I want you to favor me with the same promise I exacted from Miss Martell. If I should be asked the identity of my companion, she said... I promise that I'll never mention your name, son. I promise, too. Now pick up your beanie, son, and I'll race you to school. <laughs> Good morning, Harriet. Oh, hi, Miss Brooks. I was just going over to your classroom to look for you. Daddy said you were to march right to his office on the double. All right, Harriet. I hope my barracks bag is on straight. Now. Good morning, Mr. Conklin. Miss Brooks, English teacher first class, reporting, sir. Eddie. Yes, sit down, Miss Brooks. No, thank you. I'll stand, sir. And then I'll get right to the point. The members of my wife's family and of mine have come to town for a little family reunion. Oh, yes. Mrs. Davis mentioned that to me this morning. Yes, well, most of them are splendid people, good stock, but one or two are... Uh, well, rather eccentric, particularly my sister Hilda. Frankly, I'm worried about her, Miss Brooks. About Hilda? Yes, but I shouldn't really call her Hilda. She still uses her stage name, Joe Martell. Brooks? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the Joe is short for Josephine, you see. What did you say, Miss Brooks? I just said whoop. <laughs> That's short for I think I'll sit down after all. <laughs> Not for the fact that I need your help, Miss Brooks. I would not dare utter the horribly embarrassing impression that you are about to hear. Miss Brooks? Yes, sir? My sister is paying $35 a week to a gigolo. <laughs> I inquired as to the cad's identity, but Josephine stoutly refused to divulge his name. However, in an unguarded moment, Josephine let it slip that the rotter is a member of Madison's faculty. How do you like them apples? Not very tasty, sir. <laughs> Why are you telling me all this? Because I want you to help me unmask that ear. Well... Then it's circle. <laughs> Bear in mind, we're looking for the flicker type, Miss Brooks, and if you should need someone to assist you, say maybe Mr. Poynton could help you find the wolf I want. I don't doubt that at all. But when Mr. Boynton drove me to school this morning, I noticed he was very tired, sir. Dead tired, really. So rather than burden him with... Oh, come in, Boynton. Come in. Thank you, sir. Uh, Harriet told me I'd find you here, Miss Brooks. Here's your purse. You left it in my car. Oh, thanks, Mr. Boynton. Mr. Conklin was just telling me about his sister. He came to town for a little family reunion. Your sister, Mr. Conklin? Oh, nice. Her name is Joe Martell. See how tired he is, sir. He fell right on your floor. During the morning, Mr. Conklin made frequent visits to my classroom. And on each of those occasions, he expressed keen disappointment over my not having picked up any information which might lead to the horsewhipping of Josephine Gigolo. <laughs> As I entered the school cafeteria at noon, I was met by Harriet Conklin, who lost no time in giving me a flash. Miss Brooks, I know the man who's going with Daddy's sister. You do? Yes, ma'am. 
I wouldn't dare tell Daddy, though. It's Mr. Boynton. You're kidding. <laughs> no, I saw him escorting her into her hotel last night. And to think that woman's in her 60s. She was the firstborn in Daddy's family, Miss Brooks. Daddy was the last. That figures. <laughs> Harriet, I hope you haven't let anyone else in on that little bulletin about Mr. Boynton. Oh, no, Miss Brooks. I didn't tell a soul. Except Walter Danton. Oh. <laughs> That's like giving it to Luella. <laughs> He's lunching at the corner table, I see. Oh, I'm sure Walter won't go blabbing it around. I told him it's a secret. Good. Excuse me, Harriet. Hello, Walter. Hi, Miss Brooks. Mr. Boynton's been running around with Mr. Conklin's sister. <laughs> Congratulations. Your Secret Service badge is in the mail. <laughs> you shouldn't spread gossip like that, Walter. It could lead to Mr. Boynton's having his license revoked by the Gigolos Union. <laughs> even being dismissed from our faculty. Oh, Gosh, I wouldn't want that to happen. Actually, it's just a job, Walter. Miss Martell hired him to read books to her during the evening. Well, how do you like that? For five years, he goes more or less steady with you, only to wind up spending his evenings reading books to an old lady. Now, it just doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't. Must seem pretty tame to him after all those years of whisking me to the zoo. <laughs> but Mr. Boynton didn't really know what he was letting himself in for, Walter. Now he's got to figure a way out before Mr. Conklin can trap him. Well, maybe my agile brain can figure something out, Miss Brooks. Yeah, I'll get the old bean working, and before you know it, I might dream up something. May, may I speak with you privately, Miss Brooks? There's no need for secrecy, Mr. Boynton. Walter's head to the entire situation. Yeah, I think it's real nervous. Of course, uh, we're rather young, Mr. Boynton, but won't you join us anyway? Thanks. I just talked with Miss Martell on the phone. I have to call her at noon every day to report, you see. And she said, tonight we'll meet at 6.30, son. Son? <laughs> she calls him son. Normally, I don't meet her until 7. But in spite of my discontent, she insisted that we meet a half hour earlier. Or well, at her age, every half hour counts, I guess. <laughs> take place, Mr. Boynton. Well, now that the heat is on, I didn't care to risk meeting her at her hotel, and certainly not at my apartment, so, well, this is an emergency, Miss Brooks, so I took the liberty of giving her your address. You're meeting her at my house? We'll be safe there. See for yourself. He's going to hire a private detective the first thing in the morning. A private detective? With instructions to trail Miss Martell day and night and to surreptitiously photograph anyone with whom she's seen. Holy cow, the gig's up. Oh, you'll just have to quit, Mr. Boynton, uh, tonight. I received $140 in advance, Walter, and I've already spent it. If I should tender my resignation, I'm afraid Miss Martell would demand the return of her money. Could you demand her loot back if she were to fire you? Well, no. According to our agreement, the money's mine, provided that I merely make myself available to her at the prescribed time. Of course, Miss Martell wouldn't dream of discharging me. She's too fond of me. She boasted, in fact, that in me, she had found the direct antithesis of her former companion. Her former companion? Well, yes. She fired him upon discovering that he was possessed of a dangerous split personality, Miss Brooks. While he was at all times the quintessence of propriety in her presence, she learned that he had another side. He was in the habit of consorting with unsavory characters, crooked gamblers, and gangsters. Uh, gangsters? But wait a minute. The old bean's working. But, Mr. Boynton, you have just stumbled upon the means to get yourself back. What are you talking about, Walter? Well, a disillusion, the old girl. If you'll assume those same unsavory characteristics when you meet her tonight, Mr. Boynton, she'll probably give you the bounce just like she gave it to the other guy. You're being absurd, Walter. Why, in her own words, she once said to me, one look at you and I was convinced that you were a wholesome, homespun, clean-cut American boy. She calls him son. <laughs> If you take my advice... Oh, I'll accept I... your advice any time, Miss Brooks. What is it? Now, look, I'll admit my idea is real crazy, but it can do the trick. You've got to act tonight, Mr. Boynton. By tomorrow, the sands of time will have run out on you. It'll be Mr. Conklin who'll fire you. Miss Brooks, would you want to see Mr. Boynton leave dear old Madison? Maybe never to see him again? Oh, no. Don't listen to him, Miss Brooks. What's your advice? You've got to listen to me. Yes, give her the old split personality bit. Up to now, she's only... 
for I tan your hide. <laughs> been visiting with my sister Josephine Harriet, I happened upon a startling revelation, child. A what? Thanks to a note I discovered as I was leaving Josephine's apartment, a note which she had carelessly left near her telephone, I learned the identity of the scoundrel to whom she's paying $35 a week. It's none other than Mr. Boynton. Boynton! A gigolo! I thought he was Miss Brooks' property. <laughs> What did the note say, Daddy? It said, meet Mr. Boynton, 630 at 209 Carroll Avenue. 209 Carroll Avenue? Somehow that address strikes a familiar chord. Seems to me I wrote a Christmas card to that address on... Joe! <laughs> That's Miss Brooks' house! How did he get him, Daddy? How do you like that? She's rinsing him out! <laughs> You don't mind having dinner in the kitchen, Mr. Boynton? Well, not at all, Miss Brooks. Hey, I like this corned beef hash you cook. It's different. It must be. It's supposed to be a veal cutlet. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Martell ought to be here in a few minutes. You'd better study your part. Honey. We're in the kitchen, Mrs. Davis. There's no need to let Mrs. Davis in on our scheme, Mr. Boynton. By the time she gets back from the movies, it'll all be over. Well, I wish it were over now. I'm getting awfully nervous. Oh, excuse me, folks. I'm afraid I'll be at the movies for quite a spell, Connie. I'm going to see Frankie Sinatra and from here to eternity. Fine. I won't have to wait for the Mickey Mouse short subject, though. I read the book. <laughs> Don't forget to fill the gold piece bowl for me, Mr. Boynton. I won't. Good night, Mrs. Davis. Good night, Connie. Good evening, Margaret. Oh, of oh, good conscience. Oh, you startle me. Hello, Harriet. Oh, hi, Mrs. Davis. Were you leaving? Yes, for the movies. But it's so sweet of you to drop over. Why not visit with Miss Brooks and Mr. Boynton? They're out in the kitchen. Good idea. Splendid. We'll catch up with you later, Margaret. Good night. Good night. Come on, Daddy. She said they're in the kitchen. That's precisely why we're not going to the kitchen. Having Mrs. Davis let us in without announcing our presence is a stroke of luck. Now we can duck behind these hall curtains and eavesdrop. Oh, Daddy, isn't that an awfully sneaky trick? <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> Mr. Boynton, better wait in the living room. Sit down. Uh, where? That sofa near the hall curtain, right under the statue of the gargoyle, the one that always reminds me of Mr. Compton. <laughs> now wipe that pleasant expression off your face and try to look sinister, Mr. Boynton. Remember, you're playing an underworld part. I'll do my best, but I'm not sure I can go through with it. Oh, that must be Miss Martell. I'll wait in the kitchen for my cue. Good luck. Thanks. Uh, come in. Good evening, Mr. Boynton. How are you? I said, how are you, Mr. Boynton? Something wrong, Mr. Boynton? Sit down, babe. <laughs> babe, it's me, Mr. Boynton, Miss Martell. So what? <laughs> what? Now, let's get down to business, doll. Doll? <laughs> I thought we ought to fast the breeze a little tonight about my salary. I need more loot. Loot? Oh, what's come over you? What happened to the sweet, clean-cut boy you used to be, son? Now, look, sister. I don't, <laughs> I don't have to go into that namby-pamby act till 7 o'clock, which is when I go on duty for you according to our deal. So you got me a half hour early. So my agent insists I get a raise. And we ain't standing for no stalling from no dame, no how. <laughs> your language, Mr. Boynton. There must be some kind of a joke. You told me you're a teacher. That's right. I teach kids to pick pockets. <laughs> Wanna make something out of it? Oh, good heavens, you've gone mad. 
I wish you two wouldn't talk so loud. You're disturbing the dice game in the back room. <laughs> You. He's my agent. Now, you better cough up that raise, Chubby. We wouldn't put on to put the screws on you, would we, Philip? <laughs> That's right. I never put the screws on no dame since I left Shy. Shy? That's underworld talk. Oh, my goodness. I think I'm going to change. Not here. We'll charge you extra. <laughs> Now, let's get with it, Martell. You either cough up more moolah, or I'll put the clamps on him reading Shakespeare to you. How dare you? Just who do you think you are to address me in that manner? She's my wife, that's who. Wife? His frown. The little woman. The old ball and chain. A better half. The old battle axe. The mother of my child. He calls me Mom. <laughs> Come in. Well, well, if it isn't our son, Walter. Only 16, but big as a horse. How are you, son? <laughs> he dropped him on his head when he was a colt. Walter, this is Miss Martell. Oh, Martell. Oh, gee, you must be the chief all day to pay my day. You tell me 35 fish a week. What? Got bad news, son. She don't seem to want to give the raise. Oh, fiddle dee Oh, well, oh, well, am I going to get the moon? I'd have buy a new crooked room up wheel for school. <laughs> Goodbye, Mr. Boynton. As of this moment, consider yourself discovered. And to think I told you, huh? Well, that does it, Mr. Boynton. Uh, just about. Of course, as soon as I can dig up the amount she paid, I'll send it back to her. Every penny of it. Gosh, when she hired me just to escort her to dinner and read books to her, perfectly harmless things, the poor woman had such faith in me. And now this had to happen. Oh, come on. Cheer up, Mr. Boynton. I thought everything worked out well. So did I, Mr. Boynton. Me too, son. <laughs> Mr. Conklin. Excuse me, I gotta be blown back to shy. Oh, no, you don't. Sit down, babe. <laughs> Mrs. Davis had Harriet and me in as she was leaving for the movies, Miss Book. From behind that curtain, we heard every word of your dead end bit. I, uh, I better wait for you out in the car, Dad. Bye, folks. <laughs> well, now that our little group is down to a fortune, a bridge anyway. <laughs> bridge? Get me a tall one I can leap off. Silence. <laughs> Mr. Boynton, from what I overheard, it's clear to me now that your association with my sister Josephine was of a perfectly harmless nature. So why didn't you come to me and explain that fact? Well, sir, I was afraid that it's you... Silence! Uh... <laughs> it's also clear to me that your little gangster scene was perpetrated to goad her into firing you before I could find out you were in her employ. Well, now that it's all over, all I can say to the lot of you is... Bless you. <laughs> huh? Bless us. Bless you. Who sneezed? <laughs> I have tried vainly to dissuade Josephine from hiring male companions because those she has had in the past proved to be a mercenary lot of lame-brained loafers. In view of her violent reaction to your performance, I doubt that she'll ever hire another. I feel that I owe you a debt of gratitude. You really mean that, sir? From the bottom of my heart. I must be going now. Thank you, one and all, and good night. Wait, I think I'll go to the movies with Harriet, sir. It's all right, Mr. Morton. Good night, Mr. Brooks. Good night. Say, that gangster scheme did serve a pretty good purpose after all, Miss Brooks. Worked out fine. Uh, you know, even though it was Walter Denton's brainchild, you're the one who convinced me that I should go through with it. Uh, I, I, I don't know how to thank you, Miss Brooks. You don't? Think a little. <laughs> I wish I could think of something, but I just can't. What can I do, Miss Brooks, to show my appreciation? Sit down, babe.
teacher is as devoted to her profession as our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High, any problem of our school system is of concern to her. So when she heard recently that there was a shortage of 76,000 teachers in the country's schools, she gave the problem quite a lot of thought. I certainly did. But no matter how I tried, I couldn't figure out how to make the shortage 76,001. <laughs> Lately, it seemed more and more difficult to make ends meet. Luckily, my landlady doesn't usually press me for what I owe on my room and board. And when she does bring it up, she always manages to invent a new way of asking me for it. Take last Wednesday morning at breakfast, for instance, when she tried another new approach. Honey, you've hardly eaten a thing. How about another egg, dear? They're only 89 cents a dozen. <laughs> or a little more bacon. 79 cents a pound. <laughs> no thanks, Mrs. Davis. Well, then, what about a little bread? 25 cents a loaf. <laughs> and butter. 68 cents a pound. Uh, no thanks. Is there anything else you want, dear? Why, yes, I'd like some water. 30 cents a tank <laughs> Honestly, Mrs. Davis, if you want the money I owe you, there's no reason to hint around like that. I'm certainly no child. Just come right out and say it. I want the money you owe me. <laughs> what else is new, Grandma? <laughs> Mrs. Davis, I hate to put you off like this, but if you could be patient a little while longer, I'll pay most of what I owe you. Why don't you earn some extra money on the side, dear? Why not take an outside job? What would you suggest? Selling students door to door? <laughs> no, I'm afraid I can't follow your advice, Mrs. Davis. You remember Mr. Conklin's rule barring outside jobs for teachers. I know, but there have been times when he hasn't been so strict about enforcing it. This isn't one of them. This new ruling comes from Mr. Stone, the head of our Board of Education. But surely Osgood feels the pinch just as much as any of you. Well, you'd never know it. Why, just the other day, he bought himself a new car. What? Where did he get the money for it? I don't know, but for three days, I've been combing the school basement looking for the printing press. <laughs> I can't figure out how he's going to pay for it. Well, Connie, I wouldn't know. Oh, that must be Walter to pick me up. Come on in, Walter. The door's open. When it comes to calling for me, that kid's as regular as clockwork. And it's always such a pleasure to see him in the morning. He never seems to change from day to day. Good morning, Miss Brooks. Morning, Margaret. Except this morning when he's grown a mustache and a double chin. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Conklin. Why, Osgood. What a pleasant surprise. You think so? <laughs> well, it acts as if she'd just seen a ghost. Oh, no, sir. Ghosts don't scare me nearly as much as you. <laughs> that isn't, it isn't usually until later in the day that you scare the daylight. Uh, <laughs> it's just that I'm surprised to see you, sir. But why did you stop by, Mr. Conklin? I simply wanted the pleasure of driving you to school in my new car, Miss Brooks. You did? Why, how considerate. But I can't see any reason for you to put yourself out like this, Osgood. Can you, Connie? Not yet, I can. <laughs> no, I can't either, Mr. Conklin. Particularly when Walter's going to call for me any minute now. Oh, he won't be calling for you today, my dear. I arranged that with him last night when he came by to see Harriet. I'm taking Denton's place. Well, in that case, how about a little breakfast with us? By all means, try an egg, 89 cents a dozen. <laughs> Yes, sit down and help yourself, Osgood. I'll go into the kitchen and heat up the coffee. I really appreciate your calling for me today, sir. Oh, tut, tut, my dear. I don't want any thanks. What I intend doing every day from now on. Every day from now on? <laughs> yes, I pick you up, then I call for Mr. Boynton and then Miss Enright. Then Mr. Boynton and Miss Enright? And whatever other teachers wish to ride along. Whatever other teachers wish to ride along. <laughs> Miss Brooks, is the reception bad on your side of the table? <laughs> You'd enjoy driving to school comfortably seated in the back seat with Mr. Boynton every day, wouldn't you? Oh, certainly, sir. But where are we going to stick Miss Enright? In the glove compartment? <laughs> if there's no one else driving with us, she'll sit up in front with me. But, sir, I'm still afraid I don't understand why well, now, you're... what is there to understand, my dear? 
I simply want the teachers who have given so unstintingly of themselves over the years to have an opportunity to ride with me in my new car, to share with me the happiness, the satisfaction, the joys, the monthly payments, and the pleasure. <laughs> of my new car. Now that I'm beginning to understand, I'm terrified. Did you say monthly payment? A mere slip of the tongue. But naturally, you wouldn't expect me to pick you up for nothing, would you? <laughs> Who wouldn't? <laughs> no, sir, naturally not. So I'm charging each of you $8 a month for transportation. That will help to pay expenses for gas, oil, wear and tear. Monthly payment. <laughs> really, sir, as much as I'd like to drive with you, eight dollars a month is much more. Oh, I don't expect I money can't... today, Miss Brooks, or even tomorrow. Well, in that Ms. case, Miss Brooks, surely I'm not forcing you to ride with me. The arrangement I suggest is entirely voluntary. You can do whatever you want with whomever you want outside of school. Oh, thank you, sir. That However, let enough. me point out to you, I, <laughs> on the other hand, have complete sovereignty over you once you are within Madison's portal, and I can do whatever I want with the subjects within my domain. Do you follow me, Miss Rose? <laughs> yes, Your Majesty, right into bankruptcy. <laughs> Just a minute. Oh, good morning, Mr. Varden. Oh, I'm glad I caught you before you went into your next class. I have something to discuss with you. I think I know what it's about, Mr. Varden. You look about the way I feel. Now, how do you feel, Miss Brooks? The way you look. <laughs> Why? How do I look? The way I feel. <laughs> Anyone for who's on first? <laughs> Mr. Varden, it's apparent you, too, have had a session with Mr. Conklin. That's right. Gosh, eight dollars a month for transportation. There must be some way the three of us can get out of this additional expense. Well, I don't see how. And anyway, I'm sure Miss Enright doesn't mind it. Well, I'm sure she does. Even though she talks about her outside income, I'm certain well, good she... Good morning, dear Mr. Boynton. <laughs> My gosh, speak of the devil. <laughs> Who should show up with his twin sister? <laughs> Why are you two looking so glum this morning? Haven't you heard the good news about Mr. Conklin and his new car yet? Why, no. What hit him? Train or truck? <laughs> oh, no, nothing like that, darling. But hasn't he told you he's driving the three of us to school every morning? That's uh, just it. Where are we going to get the $8 a month he's charging? Oh, of course. How thoughtless of me. That nasty old $8 is depressing, isn't it? We'd be depressed if it was a mean, young 50 cents. <laughs> yes, I suppose that's true. With my independent income, I sometimes lose sight of these more mundane problems. Well, if there's anything I can do to help Mr. Boynton, you know where to find me. Uh-huh. All he has to do is pick up his foot, and there you are. <laughs> uh, thanks for your offer, Miss Enright, but I'll manage somehow. Well, I have to be getting to class. I'll see you two later. Oh, you're going to see a lot of me later. With <laughs> 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 this added expense, he's probably canceled his date with you already, hasn't he, Miss Brooks? How did you know? Walls have ears, darling. I know, and wallflowers have even bigger ones. <laughs> inferring that I've gone around eavesdropping, are you? If the wall fits, then paper it. <laughs> but this whole thing couldn't have worked out better for you if you'd arranged it yourself, could it? Oh, but I did arrange it, darling. What? Certainly. Poor dear Mr. Conklin was wondering how he could possibly afford this new car he had his eye on. So I suggested this <laughs> daily carpool involving you, me, and Mr. Boyd. He's glad of the idea at once. I see. Well, Miss Enright, I can thank you for one thing. It was nice of you to suggest a carpool. Why, darling? Gives me a choice of getting run over or drowning myself. <laughs> about how to get out of Mr. Conklin's carpool, the blacker the problem became. 
However, in the school cafeteria at lunch, it seemed pointless to brood over it myself. So when Walter Denton stopped by the table, I decided to tell him my sad story. I felt, with Walter's spirit, joie de vivre, and enthusiasm, I'd get an entirely different slant on my problem. Walter listened attentively, and his first words revealed the complete optimism of youth. Hey, gosh, if you ask me, you're dead. <laughs> Walter, I knew you'd find a solution. <laughs> well, let's see if I've got the story right, Miss Brooks, and I'll try again. Uh, Miss Enright persuaded Mr. Conklin to get together a carpool to meet the monthly payments on his new car. It said carpool being you, Miss Enright, and Mr. Boynton. This daily transportation entails an outlay of $8 a month apiece, which neither you nor Mr. Boynton can afford. Is that correct? That's correct. Well... If you ask me, you're dead. <laughs> well, at least we're making progress. This time you left out the gosh. <laughs> it seems to me, Walter, if you hadn't volunteered to stop calling for me when Mr. Conklin asked you to, this might never have happened. Who volunteered? I was drafted. <laughs> well, do you think I'd voluntarily give up the pleasure of driving you to school, Miss Brooks? Well, I didn't think you... Well, that I'd voluntarily give up the opportunity of seeing your smiling face across from me every morning as I tasted Mrs. Davis's succulent bacon and eggs? <laughs> as I sank my teeth into her rich, delicious pancakes? As I devoured those luscious, golden brown waffles saturated in maple syrup? <sighs> <laughs> what happened to the pleasure of driving me to school? <laughs> I really couldn't believe that you'd stop picking me up of your own accord, Walter. Oh, no, ma'am. But when I protested last night, old Marblehead, uh, Mr. Conklin, uh, gave me a choice. Either I could discontinue calling for you or give up seeing Harriet. So I made my choice. Luscious golden brown Harriet. Uh, you chose Harriet. Yes, ma'am. There are some things more important than pancakes. <laughs> Why is Mr. Boynton coming in now? He doesn't look very depressed. Why, he's even smiling. Maybe one of his baby frogs finally said da-da to him. <laughs> oh, oh, hi, Miss Brooks. Well, I guess you two have things to talk over, so I'll be going. Oh, you don't have to leave on my account, Walter. Oh, well, then I... Okay, then leave on my account. <laughs> See you later, Walter. All right. Bye, Miss Brooks. Miss Brooks, I believe I finally got it. Oh, you've had it for quite some time, huh? <laughs> You've got what, Mr. Boynton? The solution to our problem. I don't think we're going to have to pay Mr. Conklin for driving us to school after all. But how are we going to avoid it? Well, on a hunch I had, I checked with the Motor Vehicle Bureau, and I found out it's illegal to transport people for money unless you're a hack. Well, then Mr. Conklin's got nothing to worry about. He's one of the biggest hacks I've ever... <laughs> oh, you mean this taxi driver. <laughs> exactly. It's illegal to drive us around for money without a hack license. And we both know what a stickler Mr. Conklin is for legality. Oh, Mr. Boynton, you may have a solution to that. Because even if he took out a taxi license, he'd be rescinding Mr. Stone's edict against outside jobs for teachers. Right. We've got him coming and going. I won't be content until we've got sideways covered, too. <laughs> I know there's nothing to worry about anymore. Uh, do you want to break it to him, or shall I, Miss Brooks? Maybe we both can, since he's headed right for this table now. Where? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, then perhaps you'd better tell him, and I'll back you up. Maybe you'd better alert Walter, too, and he can catch us both. <laughs> well, 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 this is a stroke of luck. Two people I've been looking for at the same table. I've got some good news for you both. Good news? Yes, Miss Brooks. I've arranged to have your checks made out today instead of Friday. Oh, thank you, sir. Thus making it possible for both of you to cough up your... Uh, pay me... <laughs> pay me what we agreed on for transportation for the coming months. We'd love to pay you, Miss Conklin, but we know you wouldn't want to do anything illegal. Do anything illegal? 
me. So since it's illegal to take money for driving people without a hack license, obviously you wouldn't want to take ours without one. Oh, obviously, my dear. I couldn't take your money without a hack license, could I? Well, I'm glad we got that settled. So right after I purchased my car, I went down and got one. <laughs> Got a hack license? Complete with badge. Luckily, I knew William Jones of the Jones Cab Company. He has a fleet of three cabs already, so he just put me on his list as the fourth driver and got me the license. But, sir, you're not actually driving a cab for his company, are you? Heaven for fed. <laughs> it was merely a courtesy. Ostensibly, of course, as the fourth man, I'd be subject to call if the other three were called out at the same time. But Mr. Jones assured me that hasn't happened in the 25 years he's been in business. No, not by the remotest stretch of the imagination could my getting a hack license be construed as securing an outside job. Then would it be all right if Mr. Boynton got one? He wouldn't dare. <laughs> Sir, what would Mr. Stone think if he knew about yours? How could he know about it unless one of you were to tell him? And I'm sure that neither of you would go behind your principal's back, even if your life depended on it. <laughs> no, sir. And since it does, we won't. <laughs> oh, Miss Brooks. Yes, sir. Oh, I thought I'd let you know that Mr. Stone is coming over to see Daddy in half an hour. What's the matter? Couldn't he find a taxi in his own neighborhood? I don't see how that bit of news concerns me, Harriet. Well, you and Mr. Boynton aren't going to take what's happened to you lying down, are you? I can't speak for Mr. Boynton, Harriet, but I'm already covered up, tucked in, and my chin strap is in place. <laughs> well, it isn't fair, Miss Brooks. Daddy has no right to take advantage of you two. Why, if Mr. Stone knew about Daddy flaunting his edict this way, there'd be the devil to pay. Well, certainly no one's going to tell Mr. Stone about it. Well, no one has to, Miss Brooks. But, uh, well, suppose something accidentally happened to Mr. Stone's car, and he had to call the Jones Cab Company for a taxi from Daddy's office. But what could possibly happen to Mr. Stone's car? And it's very simple for Walter to get a box of thumbtacks from shop class. <laughs> Oh, Harriet, it still wouldn't work. Not with all the other cabs on Mr. Jones' list. You mean because Daddy is low man on the totem pole? Exactly. There are three totems, a uh, man ahead of him. <laughs> three cabs would have to be called out before they called your father. And that hasn't happened at the same time in the 25 years the cab company has been operating a fleet. Until today. <laughs> huh? Then you've thought of a way of getting rid of the fleet? Yes, Harriet, I just happened to think of a couple of sailors I know. <laughs> so, Mr. Stone, you may rest assured that no members of my faculty will ever take an outside job. Well, I'm glad to hear that, Osgood. It's good to know that in some places my edict is being obeyed. Is there any school that doesn't obey your commands, sir? Uh... Well, we did run into a little difficulty over at Jefferson High. We found that the head of the French department was spending his evenings driving an old truck around. Well, I brought him up before the board, and as punishment, we decided to give him the hardest and most unpleasant task we could find. But I thought Jefferson already had a principal. <laughs> what, whatever you did wasn't severe enough, sir. Well, there's no such problem here at noon. Come in. Uh, hello, Mr. Conklin. Did Mrs. Davis get here yet? Because... Oh, Mr. Stone. Pardon me, sir. I didn't mean to interrupt anything. You're not interrupting a thing, Miss Brooks. I was just about to leave for another appointment. But what's this about Mrs. Davis being here? Well, she said if she wasn't here, it would be an emergency. I should get into a cab and hop over to the vet. She'd be in the maternity ward. <laughs> maternity ward? At the vet? Mrs. Davis? I wish I could get that sort of attention in my classroom. <laughs> you see, it's Mrs. Davis's cat, Minerva. She's expecting. But first, I've got to pick up Sam and bring him along. Who's Sam? He's the fellow who's passing out the cigars. <laughs> uh, her husband, the neighbor's cat. <laughs> Call 
your cab, Miss Brooks. Oh, now, who's this? Maybe this is Sam. <laughs> oh, my back. My back. My back. What, what, what is it? It's his back. <laughs> here, here. Sit down, Boynton. Sit down. There, now, oh. tell me what happened. I think I wrenched my back, sir. It might even be broken. I fell down as I was leaving school. It was all I could do to get in here. Oh, my back. Oh, oh he'd better get home as quickly as possible. You're so right, Mr. Stone. I'll call for two cabs at once. <laughs> the Jones Cab Company hasn't had this much business in ages. <laughs> the Jones Cab Company? <laughs> yes, you remember. We always take from them. <laughs> what do you need two cabs for? Why can't you both get into one cab? We could, but why waste the extra one I'm calling for? <laughs> Miss Brooks, I'm sure that one cab will be Oh, quite good. But... There's a man in pain here. Let her call a dozen cabs if she wants to. Oh, no, sir. Three will do the trick nicer. Oh. <laughs> I'll get on the phone at once, sir. And in the meantime, if you can make it, Boynton, why don't you go into Mr. Conklin's inner office and stretch out on the couch? Uh, yes, sir. I'll do that, sir. I'll go. Yes. Now, uh, go ahead with that phone call, Miss Brooks. You can get the number of the cab company from the operator. Oh, that won't be necessary, sir. It's right here on your desk under this little paperweight. Paperweight? What paperweight? Let's see. It says badge number 374. Go ahead with the call if you're going to. <laughs> Hello? Jones Cab Company? Would you send over two cabs to Madison High at once? That's right, two cabs. It is? Say, isn't that interesting? Yes, I'll hang on. He's checking on the cabs now. He says this is the first time in 25 years that all three cabs will be out at the same time. Luckily, there's a fourth cab driver they can reach in an emergency. <laughs> yes, that, that is fortunate. No cab company should ever leave themselves so short-handed that they're up against it. Well, luckily, there's a fourth cab driver. They can reach in an emergency. <laughs> Denton. Uh, well, sir, I thought I'd better come up and tell Mr. Stone I was patching his car just now and a few of his tires are flat. <laughs> Bingo! A uh, few of my tires? <laughs> How many? Uh, not counting the spare, four. <laughs> I'm sure I can in a couple of hours. I haven't got a couple of hours. I'm late for my next appointment as it is. Miss Brooks. While you're on that phone, tell them to contact that emergency cab and send it right over. Yes. Uh, emergency uh, cab? <laughs> Ready for the paperweight now. Uh, uh, Mr. Stone, why bother to ask them to contact anybody? I'll take you to your appointment in my car. What are you trying to do, sir? Cut out the middleman? <laughs> your offer is good, but the cab will be over in a minute or two. Go ahead, Miss Brooks. Oh, Denton, you go out front and let me know when the cab gets here. Yes, Hello? Cab company? Uh, you can send over those two cabs. Good. Well, I've just got another customer for you. Uh-huh. Better contact him at once. Uh, uh, Mr. Stone, believe me, it's absolutely no trouble to drive you wherever you're going. Absolutely none whatsoever. Look, we can leave at once. My car... And, and miss this well, phone call? <laughs> Since I'm so close, I'll get it, Mr. Conklin. Hello? Yes, he's right here. It's for you, Mr. Conklin. Oh, oh, for me? Uh, hello? No, I'm sorry. You must have the wrong number. Oh, well, how do you like that? It's the first time I ever heard of anyone asking for the right person and getting the wrong number. Now, Mr. Stone, I deem it a pleasure and a privilege if you'd only allow me... Hello? Yes, he's still here, all right, but you've still got the wrong number. Oh, what on earth is this all about? Let me have that phone, Miss Brooks. No, no, Mr. Stone! Office. What? Why, yes, I certainly will give him that message. That was the Jones Cab Company, Osgood. They said you should drive your cab over and pick up a fare at Madison High School. <laughs> Do you know what this means? <laughs> <laughs> 
He hasn't far to travel. <laughs> you just don't believe me. Things aren't the way they appear to be. And if you let me explain... I haven't time for explanations, Conklin. Right now, I have to get my next appointment. So you'll be good enough to drive... Oh, there. yes, Mr. Stone. I'll be glad to, yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. And that way, you'll certainly be able to prove one thing. Prove one thing? What's that, Miss Brooke? If it's true what they say about educators being poor tippers. Oh, <laughs> 